And next speaker is Sean Marshall, who's a Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary. Um, his book, entitled Cryosphere, uh, came out last year and is going to tell us all about it. It's a privilege to be here, so thanks to Allison and Princeton University Press. Thanks to the Princeton Environmental Institute for hosting this. It's pretty nice to meet uh, again some of the co-authors and feel like part of this series. It's a, it's a real privilege to be part of this series. It's also a privilege to be representing the cryosphere, which as uh, just kind of alluded is a bit of a newcomer to the table in terms of at least a lot of our IPCC class climate models and in terms of thinking of snow and ice within the climate system. And many people have been thinking about this for a long time, but I, I think that in many ways the cryosphere has come of age because of what a dramatic response we're seeing in the cryosphere to climate change, and I'll, and I'll kind of close to that as I, as I talk about snow and ice in the climate system. Um, I would say that overall the cryosphere is, is intertwined in lots of aspects of our base climate, even if we're not directly affected by the cryosphere, and I'll take us through those a little bit. Um, it's probably not as much of a determinant of climate is atmosphere and ocean and the carbon cycle, but it's in there and it keeps coming up today. And even if it's not as much of a determinant of our, our base climate, I would say that uh, it's probably the most photogenic part of the climate system. So I, I also have lots and lots of slides that I'll go quickly through because it's a pretty dense, heavy day and there's some, some nice pictures that we weren't able to include in the book because of course they're color photos and so on. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the cryosphere in a, in a lighter way as well. This is a fairly subtle photo uh, of one of our field sites in Canadian Arctic, but I, at first I was gonna make a joke that um, something about this is how a lot of the US sees Canada as what Canada looks like. <laughs> but it's actually not such a good joke because when I left Calgary yesterday, we were under a big blanket of snow, so it's a bit, it's a bit too close to home. Uh, the cryosphere, that's snow and ice in the climate system, and there's lots of different kinds and flavors of snow and ice in the climate system. Um, the reason it's of interest in that it's part of the climate system is that for um, lots of interesting reasons, water on our planet is, is really close to its triple point. We have the triple point of water at zero degrees C, 0 0.01 degrees C. So I haven't thought about that, it's 32.02 .02 degrees Fahrenheit, I guess. Um, and it's the only common substance on the planet which lives at its triple point where solid and liquid and vapor phases coexist in about half the world's surface area at, at, at ground level experiences that temperature zero degrees C at some point during the year. And in the atmosphere, the whole planet experiences this at some level in the troposphere. And so we have ice, snow, vapor coexisting and this leaves in, in transitions between these phases and movements within this um, actually really, really affect our climate in, in ways that some, some of you may not have thought of before. Um, so that's one of the quirks of water. There are many interesting properties of water. Uh, another that we've touched on already indirectly, I think, is that it has an un unusually high heat capacity. And the latent heats of vaporization and fusion are really high for water. N not just, not, they're not alone in this, but of common substances, again, they're just really unusually high. And it's mostly related to small molecules with hydrogen bonds giving strong intermolecular uh, attractions such that it's hard to break apart those, those water molecules. You can almost think of water molecules as teenagers. It takes a lot of energy to motivate them or to kind of get them moving. And that's essentially the way water is in the system. And that affects the behavior and the heat capacity and the, the thermal buffering of water in the system. Another interesting property is it's it's got this interesting density inversion at four degrees C that many of you will know about. Um, common materials, as you cool them, um, they become more dense, so warm air expands, cool air contracts. Water does this liquid water up to a point, um, but beyond this four degree mark, as in between four degrees, and as you get into super cooled water droplets in the atmosphere, the density is, is actually dropping as it gets cold. That's very unusual behavior. It affects uh, lake, ice in, in many environments in high latitudes because it affects the turnover point and the formation of, of lake ice in these systems. It leads to flushing and mixing that's kind of an unusual range. Um, it's a, something that's somewhat related to the solid phase structure of, of ice. So we'll have a few pretty pictures of snowflakes, but I think 
Most of you know that at our surface temperatures and pressures, we have the solid form of ice is ice 1H. It's a hexagonal crystal structure. It's, it's a very um, spacious structure. It's very rigid, and it likes to have a lot of space. These ice crystals need a lot of elbow room to move. So the density for these snow and ice crystals is way below the charts here, down to 917 kilogram per meter cubed. And the best explanation, or the, the one I like the most of, of this density inversion of, of water uh, between below four degrees C is um, from James Truffle, a physicist who, who commented that, that water never seems to forget that it was once ice. Um, so as you get really, really cold water, super cold water droplets, they, 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 they seem to, to start to spread out in somewhat of a form of those tetrahedral water structures that you get in that rigid ice crystal lattice. Another aspect of this, and a really huge quirk for the climate system, is that um, water floats in its own melt <laughs> because it's such a low density. And not many materials do that. Again, bismuth, which interestingly, we've, not coincidentally, we've already heard about does, germanium does, diamonds do. And none of these are really, really common. And, and living at that <laughs> liquid phase at our surface pressures, maybe somewhere in the universe you can find uh, a sea of diamonds with starlight sparkling off of diamond bergs floating around in there, but um, here we're, we're left with, with water ice floating in its own melt. It means that when you freeze the, uh, the oceans or lakes, the ice floats on top rather than sinking to the bottom like a normal material would in a solid phase, should be more dense. If sea ice did that as you froze, you can imagine how different our oceans would be in terms of mixing ice and albedo of the planet. Um, we don't have diamond bergs, but we have icebergs which, which have served their own sort of purpose of just being extraordinarily beautiful features of the climate system. Um, snowflakes have their own quirks. Kenneth Libeck out at uh, Caltech has done this wonderful job of documenting and photographing uh, snowflakes, both uh, ones uh, generated in the lab and the natural snowflake structures. There's an infinite combination that truly is an infinite combination of sort of hexagonal structures within these. One of the things which I pondered as I wrote this book and, and found kind of n nice to think about was how delicate and tenuous and fragile these snowflakes are. You've all seen stellar dendrite crystals come down, I think, here, and, and they'll, they'll, they really are ephemeral. They'll melt immediately on the ground, and you lose some of those nice branch-like structures. But under the right conditions, these things can grow up to become continents, like, like Antarctica. It's made of snowflakes <laughs> in places four kilometers thick in the middle of Antarctica. 98% of this continent is just one uh, big ice sheet that's formed from snowflakes that have, that have settled, compacted, and come to grow over millions of years, in this case, into this, this large ice sheet. This is just at home in the Canadian Rockies, but same thing, this is ice, that's snowflakes that fell during the Little Ice Age that have compacted to give intense, beautiful blue ice that's melting out at the edges, again, just snowflakes recrystallized into, into glacier ice. Um, so snow and ice is, is there throughout the system. I'll, I'll spend a little more time introducing different flavors of snow and ice in the system. Um, for those people living in high latitudes, it's, it certainly is part of life and we're, we're used to this. Um, this isn't normal in Canada, but this is a deep snowpack in Labrador <laughs> uh, from a few years ago. Um, you're used to snow around here, although this is an adaptation we don't have in Canada. We don't usually have snow umbrellas. This is Central Park. Um, and everyone here has experienced snow at some levels, I think. Last winter, they, they uh, had an unusual amount of snow in the southern Europe, and they were cross-country skiing in the Colosseum in Rome. Um, parts of the Adriatic froze up, so it's, it's occasionally touches even, uh, even our subtropical latitudes here. It's beautiful when it comes can also create some havoc. So this is a freezing rain-coated tree or a rime-coated tree. Can't see this as well because the lights are up here, but I think if frost or freezing rain tends to hit orchards, it can be quite expensive for fruit prices in the stands. This is one I really liked, actually. I just found it on the web maybe a couple of nights ago, but does anyone know this? Yeah, it's a lighthouse in uh, Lake Erie in, in Ohio. So this is a lighthouse standing here, and it's been wave smattered and frozen. It actually reminded me very much of this. <laughs> Some of you have seen an image like this before somewhere. <laughs> um, river and lake ice uh, is something that we all deal with. Ice fishing 
people love this, of course, but rivers and lakes freeze up at all the high latitudes. It's quite important in uh, many countries as a transportation network through the winter seasons. So inaccessible tundra through the summer, summer and fall months seasonally freezes over and, and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of roads are opened up through the winter, seasonal, seasonal ice roads. And these are, um, of course, also subject to uncertainty as we lose our edges around the, the, the ice, ice road season and people are adapting to really losing weeks at, at either end in terms of having good, good reliable ice season. Um, but this is really part of the fabric at higher latitudes. Um, we'll go to larger scales now. Sea ice is, is something that's been in the news a lot this fall because of Arctic sea ice reaching a record minima. I'll say a bit more about that. Um, but it's, again, a very dramatic and, and really large scale feature of the planet in both polar regions. And this shows the scale to some extent here of a typical late summer Arctic ice pack. You also see uh, some sense of the permanent glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet coming in here. We've heard a bit about this throughout the day. There are only two big ice sheets in the world, sort of continental scale ice sheets, one in Antarctica over the south and then the Greenland ice sheet here. Uh, both have their vulnerabilities to, to climate fluctuations, climate change. Um, this one is more sensitive to temperature in a way because it's already experiencing melt over its, in, over, well, this summer over its entire area, whereas Antarctica is still cold enough. There's not too much warm air getting at the Antarctic ice sheet yet. It's vulnerable to what's happening at the ocean, but not so much through the atmosphere just yet. It's buffered by being minus 30 to minus 50, whereas this has lots of temperatures near that really sensitive triple point around the edges. Um, in addition to the big ice sheets, we've got um, count, uncounted, uncounted numbers of smaller valley glaciers and ice caps. It's estimated to be something, people just say something more than 200,000. They really don't know how many smaller glaciers and ice caps there are. We also don't know how, how thick these are. Less than 0.1% of the world's smaller glaciers have actually had any work done on them or any measurements made on them. So for a handful, we were able to measure ice thickness through radar work or something like that. Um, but for most of them, we don't really know. So it's, it's estimated really just within about a factor of two how much glacier ice there is in the world in these smaller glaciers and ice caps. I think within the Earth system, it's a bit embarrassing, actually. Um, as much as we don't know a lot about the oceans and the deep oceans, at least we know the ocean volume reasonably well, to probably do within a few percent. But uh, that's, that's not true for the world's, for the world's glaciers. And then the final piece of cries here that I'll mention, discuss a little bit here, is has been mentioned already in the context of carbon storage in, in frozen soils. This shows um, some really massive ice deposits in some uh, coastal zones um, in Siberia in this case. Uh, permafrost is a really interesting feature. It's kind of uh, quiet until recent years, I think, as part of the climate system because it responds very slowly. But the deepest permafrost in the world goes down to more than almost a mile thick, more than 1,500 meters thick in parts of Siberia, and that's just frozen ground. Deep down, that's not believed to be very much in the way of sort of locked up stored carbon, but the upper few meters of the permafrost, the upper 10, 20 meters, which are responding to, to climate warming, are, are of a lot of interest right now in terms of as this thaws and melts, how is it changing the landscape in terms of thaw slumps and coastal instability, and also, of course, carbon release. So the snow and ice is kind of there everywhere. Um, if you're at high latitudes or even here at mid-latitudes, then you're used to snow and ice affecting your life a little bit. This is my patriotic bit, I think. If you can see it, it's a maple leaf encased in ice here. Um, people at home are very well adapted to snow and ice. People, in, and this goes back to Rome from last winter, um, they're, they're sort of figuring out how to adapt to snow when it visits them, I think. Um, Snow and ice in the world expands and contracts pretty dramatically in a seasonal cycle. It's the most changeable element of the landscape, and that makes it fairly interesting in terms of its albedo and its interaction with atmosphere and formation of high-pressure weather systems seasonally over the continents. Um, this shows an interesting phenomenon that we've also heard about a bit today. It's a very northern hemisphere-centric phenomenon of the cryosphere in a way, or changeability of the cryosphere. In today's world, with today's continents concentrated at the higher latitudes, Antarctica has a very predictable and sort of contained and, in fact, sort of 
sort of lat latitudinally cycling uh, ice sheet and sea ice structure. It's rather simple in some ways in terms of its cryosphere versus the sort of complicated arrangement we have in the north. But this can be broken down, and it's just discussed um, kind of in side-by-side -side chapters in the book separately about permafrost and ice sheets and glaciers and ice shelves and seasonal snow and, and sea ice. I think the fun part comes in bringing together these elements of the cryosphere into their roles in the climate system. So I'll, I'll say a bit about that in the last few minutes here. Um, I think I've mentioned that cryosphere in today's world maybe not as big a determinant of our base climate as, as carbon and atmosphere and ocean. There have been times, such as Snowball Earth, where, where the cryosphere had its day, I guess, on the planet. So if you're really interested in Earth system history and some of the variations in the past, there's a lot to learn from the cryosphere and the feedbacks involved in the cryosphere. Uh, you don't have to go as far back as Snowball Earth. Uh, after Michael's talk now, I wish I was going to say a little bit more about the last glacial cycle or the last glacial maximum, but I didn't build much in. But just 20,000 years ago, we had pretty big ice sheets over most of the northern hemisphere landmass. I don't know the story in New Jersey. There must have been several hundred meters of ice down here out to the, out to the coast, the shelf break here. Um, and 20,000 and then disappearing some point during deglaciation, probably kicking in 16 to 14,000 years ago, the ice would have pulled back from this, from this region. And geologically speaking, that's not very long ago. That's kind of just a couple of minutes ago in terms of Earth history. Um, and the cryosphere and the, the albedo feedbacks and water vapor feedbacks and hydrological cycle feedbacks and how those may have affected the oceans were of a lot of interest in this, in this time. Essentially, the ice sheets helped to take, along with the carbon cycle that we've heard about, helped to take a pretty small orbital forcing, a pretty small nudge from the orbits and transform it into this really enduring, you know, 100,000 year, quite dramatic shift in the, in the planetary climate. So the albedo feedbacks we've heard about and talked about a lot, they're pretty intuitive. There's not much stronger in terms of a climate kick than shifting from white to blue. So ice and snow that may reflect 70, 80% of sunlight back to space, shifting to oceans which absorb 90% of the sunlight that's, that's coming in. That's really just a, a switch. It's not a dial that you're turning up. It's really just a an on-off switch in terms of going from reflected light to absorbed solar radiation. And that's a pretty uh, simple to understand concept. It's one that's really playing out strongly right now in, in climate feedbacks, at least on a regional scale, where we're losing our snow and ice around the edges. Um, this is maybe a little bit um, hard to work through. I won't explain every graph, but you can model in fairly simple models something in between the David's envelope and a full-blown climate model. You can explore the effects of having, um, say, in this case, a glacial, a present day in an ice-free world in terms of zonally averaged albedo. So this is averaging albedo for lines of longitude all around the planet, plotting it from the South Pole to the North Pole. You can go through, th through these systems and have some fairly simple treatment of the planet and actually have clouds in here. And you can find roughly this range of temperatures for that conditions so of the last glacial maximum, a world of about 9 degrees C as the global average temperature, to today's world, 14 degrees C, to an ice-free world of about 18 degrees C. And it actually saturates there, of course, once you have lost your snow and ice, then you can keep warming and that effect is, is gone. So the ice albedo effect is actually not linear. You can keep going with this towards your snowball state. and it, it, of course, falls off a cliff at some stage, as, as Michael explained. Um, but so this is a hard upper limit. And as you go and start to bring snow and ice into the, into the mid-latitudes and the lower latitudes, where there's a lot of sunlight coming in, you really, really get a much, much stronger albedo feedback. The, the, the actual effect of the snow ice albedo feedback is a bit muted in today's world because most of the action is, is at these higher latitudes where the sunlight's uh, uh, a little bit weak. It tends to be... Um, not as strong as if you could get some ice and snow into, into the lower latitudes where there's a lot stronger sunlight to go through on all those bifurcations, the white to blue. Um, for that reason, you do see really strong response of mountain glaciers everywhere in the world. This is not white to blue, but in many ways it's much the same. This is a typical glacier terminus in a, in a mountain range 
where the end of the summer melt season, this is almost like rock, <laughs> dark, dark surfaces, because as you melt down the ice every year and the melting area at the, at the base of these glaciers, the debris just gets concentrated year after year after year. Snow and ice melt away, but that debris just sits, sits there on top unless it gets washed off through some surface streams. So you tend to accumulate quite dark surfaces, especially if you've had eruptions or forest fires or any other sources of anthropogenic uh, uh, carbon. Where we work in the Canadian Rockies, we actually see a lot of mining smelter uh, material coming into the, into the high mountains and the, into the glacial systems here, which is being concentrated in the glaciers. This is actually uh, an albedo of about 0.1. When we are doing albedo surveys and we walk off the glacier, sorry, the albedo actually goes up when we hit the limestone. <laughs> it's actually brighter when we leave the glacier. Um, so that's, we could talk for a long time about snow ice albedo feedbacks. They're, they're fairly simple, but they're also too simply represented so far in our climate models, I think. For instance, you don't tend to have a, a good representation of how surfaces get darker through the summer melt season. That was really important in this year's record melting in Greenland. Um, this doesn't get talked about as much, the cryosphere is the latent energy sink. This is, relates very much to what we heard about in terms of the oceans as a thermal buffer in terms of evaporation, but also as heat capacity. Without taking you through the tables and numbers, it's, um, we calculated at about 550 terawatts of energy that goes in um, to melting snow and ice through the year. This would be a terawatt year. It's <laughs> the amount of energy that goes into the seasonal snow and ice melt and active layer melt and permafrost zones. It's roughly 20% of the solar radiation that's in, uh, incident in the high latitude, 60 to 90 north in, the, in their sun season. <laughs> um, I have trouble thinking what a terawatt is. Uh, it's a huge number. <laughs> um, so I looked up in the BP annual reports of global energy consumption. So a big power plant is you know, three gorges or a, you know, a big nuclear plant. You're talking sort of gigawatt power. Um, global energy consumption in 2009, about 15 terawatts. So this is a, you know, 36 times that. This is a lot of energy going into melting snow and ice. And this is built in, that's just, this isn't climate change, this is just the business as usual, seasonal melting in, in advance of the sea ice at, at each pole and of the seasonal snow blanket and of the active layer in the permafrost zones and a bit of lake and river ice in there. And this is actually a, uh, an energy sink, so energy that's in the system is going into melting this rather than to warming things up. And this is almost a service that, that snow and ice are providing to us, kind of like the oceans acting as a buffer and soaking up some CO2 and heat for us. As we lose the cryosphere, we're going to lose this buffer a little bit. And so instead of a lot of energy, whether it's uh, re-radiated long wave energy or whether it's solar energy, a lot of energy that goes in melting snow and ice. Um, now, once that snow and ice is gone and that ice-free world goes into warming things up further. So it's, it's not a big number compared to the evaporative energy, that, um, but it's a big number for polar regions. And I won't go through all these in detail just for time, but there are ways that Antarctica has very much shaped its own climate through its uh, surface topographic input uh, impact. Uh, so orographic forcing of something like the Laurentide ice sheet or the Antarctic ice sheet or the ice sheet in Greenland really modifies and changes the, the essential climate. And there's more subtle effects associated with surface roughnesses and heat capacities. Um, carbon storage and permafrost we've mentioned. Um, the cryosphere, seasonal snow and runoff from ice sheets and sea ice formation and melting really affect the freshwater budgets of the world and the, the whole hydrological cycle uh, with some interesting uh, and not very well understood in my view uh, impacts in ocean circulation and mixing, both in terms of runoff from Arctic rivers and places like the Greenland ice sheet, but also in terms of that export of that fresh water and, and how that combines with changing sea ice uh, formations of sea ice formation and, and, and melt. Um, so this is a real large imperative, in fact, for getting the cryosphere better represented into climate models. Um, to actually look at these freshwater budgets on land, but also in terms of the ocean circulation. And a couple examples maybe I will give for global sea level. This has come up a few times today. Uh, people always want numbers, and we don't have numbers yet, but it's pretty clear that sea level's rising. That's, that's been well documented and well measured. It's pretty clear that the glaciers and ice sheets are in trouble. 
Uh, almost every single, almost every mountain range of the world, Greenland, Antarctica, are all contributing to, to global sea level rise, to the rise of the oceans. This is a remarkable record that's just come from the GRACE satellite, uh, GRACE gravity satellite in the past decade. This is essentially weighing the Greenland ice sheet and it, the GRACE satellite orbits um, uh, all the world and you can actually, as it's going over, they're getting better and better at, at understanding the regional gravitational signatures from this gravity satellite. So they have these monthly estimates of how much the Greenland ice sheet weighs. <laughs> And you can see snow accumulating in the winter, snow melting. So this is almost like the Keeling curve. It's not breathing here. It's just snow accumulating and melting through Greenland. And it's got that seasonal cycle, but it's also got this uh, disturbing trend, which is really the, the ice gushing off of Greenland, either through iceberg discharge and, and things like this, breaking up off of Greenland, or through runoff, melting and runoff. And I mentioned Greenland had a record summer melt for the first time in the satellite era, the whole this is a very dramatic image. It's from NASA, I think. The whole ice sheet turned red, <laughs> which um, is indicating areas of the ice sheet that experience some melting. So for the past 35 years, while we've had satellites measuring the melt area of the ice sheet, this is a fairly typical look of the last few years where, where you've got uh, lots of melting in South Greenland and around the edges, but in the middle where we do our ice coring, uh, there's not usually any melt in the summer seasons. Um, there's pretty intensive melt over the whole ice sheet this summer. Has happened in the past. You can see hints of melt every 100 to 200 years in the ice core records, but we've never really witnessed a year like this, and it's part of an ongoing trend where you can bet that this is not going to be a 150-year cycle any anymore going forward. We don't know how quickly the Greenland can melt away. We saw an estimate earlier today of a few few centuries. I think glaciologists are still a bit conservative on that, and they would like a, a thousand years or more to do it. But those same glaciological models can't actually replicate this. They, they can't actually replicate what's happening to the ice sheet right now because of things like icebergs breaking off and melting at the ice ocean interface. And so we're pretty sure that in a world that's two, three, four, or five degrees warmer, Greenland uh, doesn't want to be there. The Green Greenland ice sheet will melt away, and there's enough feedbacks involved that you can be pretty confident in that as the surface drops, it gets warmer, it gets darker, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feed back, and it, and it will chase itself away. Um, it's hard to say how quickly this can happen. It's hard to say whether it's 50 centimeters or one meter of sea level rise this century or going forward, whether Greenland can hang in there 500 years or 5,000 years, and the, the models are still struggling to, to get the the fast flow physics and the ice ocean interactions in there to actually look at that. Um, but it's pretty clear and it's evident in the last interglacial period when things were a bit warmer that, that this level of warming that we're pretty well committed to is, is going to make it hard for Greenland to, to be healthy. Um, and that begs the question that I'll finish on, which is kind of the wither, the world's cryosphere. Where is our snow and ice going? The ice sheets will stick in here for a while, but, but mountain glaciers definitely are retreating up slope, disappearing a bit from the landscape. We've lost uh, uh, the number of something like 5,000 glaciers already in the last 30 years have just kind of gone. <laughs> um, the glacier mass balance is, this is from some composite of, of the global network of mountain glaciers that are measured and, and monitored. And this is a measure of thinning rates over those glaciers. And you see through this period that it's, it's, it's almost always a red bar with recent, the last decade being roughly, uh, this is millimeters of thinning, so, so something like 70 centimeters, 700 millimeters of, of thinning on average over these glaciers. So this is an accelerating and a, and a negative trend for these systems. It's hard to find a, uh, a large region where the, the glaciers aren't thinning and retreating. This is the case for the sea ice from this, um, past uh, summer that we heard about. We've seen that this record minima was already on its way. It was already clear that this was happening in August, and it continued, but it's part of a longer-term trend, kind of like the Greenland melting area, that we've um, seen late summer Arctic sea ice extent declining at a pretty, pretty strong rate, so 10% per decade. And if, if you ignore any curvature and, and, and just take that at face value, then you can tell that that's not going to survive the century, the Arctic summer sea ice. Um, 
And most people are, don't expect it to survive through to 2050 in terms of August, September, Arctic sea ice. This is the, it's kind of near the minimum, the final extent that this reached. So this year, 2012, Arctic ice extent really sort of set a pretty emphatic new record for the minimum sea ice extent. It was under 4 million square kilometers, and it uh, solidly sort of went under the 2007 minimum extent. This is the, the mean conditions from 1979 to 2000, plus or minus two standard deviations. So if you, if you want to think of it that way, we're like four or five standard deviations below normal. It's, it's a new normal for the, for the Arctic sea ice. So it's a different world for the Arctic sea ice. And this isn't talked about too much. It needs to be talked about more, I think. But to me, it's a, as dramatic an effect and a, and a climatic influence as the sea ice changes. This is Northern Hemisphere snow cover anomaly, where you see just the same thing. Of course, 2012 set a new record, which I didn't hear much. This, a lot of this work is done out of Rutgers, in fact. Um, and this is, um, again, very compelling. It looks like Greenland. It looks like the sea ice. So I think this is. Um, Everyone uh, has talked about the, the, the idea that your sort of whatever you work on is, is the most important thing and the most strongest canary in the coal mine with respect to climate change. And so I won't use that term. But I think the fact that snow and ice is so close to its point of, of, of viability to that zero degree mark for large parts of the planet, maybe Antarctica accepted where it's still so cold. Um, it, it is really, really susceptible to something like a one degree warming that we've already undergone. So in terms of the world's climate systems, the, the cryosphere is, is incredibly sensitive to, to smaller temperature changes, half degree, one degree, two degree. It's feeding back on the system. It's having regional feedbacks, which compound that. Um, but it's a very simple system in a way to look for and monitor and detect change and to understand a little bit about what's happening in some of these regions. So I finish, I'll finish with that. I think a lot of people in the Chrysler community are a bit worried about job security, but I think these, <laughs> uh, I think in many ways, uh, they're kind of watching to see what will happen with these ice sheets. And as long as you go far enough to the polar regions, Greenland, Antarctica, this ice is gonna kick in there for a while. But I think, um, I think we've started a process already, losing a lot of ice out of West Antarctica and losing a lot of ice out of Greenland that, I think it's really important to better understand how those systems are changing and feeding back within the climate. So it's, it's really nice to be able to chat with colleagues here and think about what we can learn from the past on that and what we can learn from some of the interactions in the whole system. Thanks.